So uh, my name is Theodore Gray. Um, I'm a co-founder of Wolfram Research. I was at the company for, I think it's 23 years continuously. And then I went off for um, quite a while, like 10 years or so doing other things. Um, but I'm back now and working um, primarily on chat you know, LLM AI related features, particularly related to education. Um, but today I'm just gonna give you a basic introduction to chat notebooks um, and uh, <clears throat> what, what they are and why they are. So to start, go back a little bit in history. Um, if you think about, you know, the 1980s or so, the way that you interacted with a computer system like Mathematica or like, you know, any operating system shell or whatever is you give it a command, it gives you an answer. It's a back and forth, you know, prompt response sort of thing. And the way in which that was done is what was referred to as a glass teletype interface model, of course, after paper teletypes. And, you know, a fundamental property of these things is that the record is immutable. It just scrolls along. It's either actually literally printed on paper or it's going off on the screen. And there's really no way to interact with the past because it's happened. Um, but this is obviously unnecessarily limiting. And, you know, sort of the origin story of notebooks was just the idea, well, why, why can't you edit the, the previous inputs? Why can't you just go back and select something in your history and, you know, reevaluate it or edit it slightly and reevaluate it? And it turns out if you make one small addition, which, which we called cell brackets, basically delimiting which, in, what's input and what's output, then uh, you don't have to select a whole range of input. You can just click anywhere within an input cell and it knows to reevaluate that whole command. And if you've labeled output separately from input, then it could automatically delete the output. So you, your new output replaces old, which isn't possible in a plain text document. So that's, that's where notebooks came from. Now it's, and, and it, this is obviously, you know, a tremendously powerful idea. It's been copied um, lovingly, if inadequately by Jupyter Notebooks. Um, but, you know, it's, it's a very good idea and it works very well. Um, so it's a little interesting to see that, you know, chat interfaces, LLM, you know, chatbot interfaces are basically glass teletype interfaces in their, their fundamental implementation. And I think that's because they're sort of modeled after um, human chat interfaces, namely, you know, text messaging or, you know, other such sort of social media things where the glass teletype interface is kind of appropriate because the, the conversation did happen and it's not mutable. You can't go back and as much as you might want to change what you said uh, and have that become the new reality. Um, but again, in the case of interacting with a chatbot, you're interacting with a computer system, you can change the past. They are in fact completely stateless. They have no memory whatsoever, other than what you supply them each time in a chat interaction. So it's actually a perfect use case for a notebook interface. And so that's what we, we decided to do is we're going to implement, um, a, you know, the first approximation, simply an interface to a chatbot, except it's a notebook. So you can go back and edit the old inputs you can rerun conversations. You can see what would happen if you changed, you know, prompting or what are other settings or just edited your input or edit the output because you can change what the, the, the chat bot said and it will believe you. Um, uh, just very, it's meant to be a very practical talk. Um, so I'm going to actually demonstrate how to do this. So the first thing is um, how do you create a, uh, what we call chat enabled notebook? Um, the way I always do it is just say new notebook like that. Uh, except I already have one here, so we'll use this one. Uh, now, if you do that, um, for various, um, you know, implementation reasons, this is an ordinary notebook and it doesn't have chat features enabled in it. But if you're using a sufficiently recent version of, you know, later 13 point something, you know, any, any sort of current version, you'll have this new icon in the toolbar. And if you click that, you can, uh, you get this uh, little enable chat features and you click that. Um, and now you have a whole new menu. And this is now a chat enabled notebook. Um, you can also do it directly here. Uh, and we'll get to that one later. You can do it this way, but I don't know. I just always do it by creating a notebook. And what does it mean to be chat enabled? What it means is that, um, oh, and, and in the future, we hope for 14.0, but maybe not. But so whatever the next version, there isn't gonna be a difference anymore. Just any new notebook is gonna have this capability and it was just sort of purely for practical reasons that we didn't do that right away. Um, but in the future, this will not be an issue. 
So when you have a chat-enabled notebook, the thing you could do is type a single quote character, which I can't show you, show you me doing that, but I just type single quote. And so now we have a new type of input cell, which is distinguished by this blue border. And there's this uh, icon on the side, which is actually a drop down menu with a bunch of choices that we'll get to. Um, and this cell, um, uh, I'll just say hello. Um, if I type shift return, just like a regular input cell, um, instead of sending it to Mathematica, it sends it to, in, in this case, I've selected GPT-4 as my model. If we look at the menu here, it's going to GPT-4. Um, and uh, we'll get to personas in a minute, but I'm basically using the default um, code assistant persona, which likes to write Mathematica code. Um, so, uh, let me just do a couple of examples and then we can see, um, uh, let's say, um, so I'm again gonna, if I just type, if I just start typing, um, let's see, let's say sine of X here, right? Um, so this is regular Mathematica input. Now I type a single quote. Uh, this is actually a variation I have not tried me before. So um, this demonstrates the fact that um, chat history in the chat notebook world is everything that comes above the input cell, the chat input cell that you're evaluating. Um, and uh, this sometimes is a little bit slow because we're at the mercy. I mean, this is going off to OpenAI's GPT-4 servers, which are sometimes very busy and sometimes things are slow. Um, but the point is, it knew um, it knew that I was talking about the sine function because it looked. Um, and there we go. Um, and it was very sensible, and you know, figured out how to make a plot, and that I wanted, you know, that minus two pi to two pi would might be a reasonable um, plot range. Sometimes it picks zero to two pi. You know. It's an LLM, so it's not consistent always. Um, so right now, um, the, this the fact that it saw the sign of X there, like this is super convenient because it means I can do this, which like, you know, what the Star Trek is that, um, that you can say that something like that to a computer and it actually works. Um, but it also means that Anytime you evaluate a chat input cell in a notebook, you kind of need to be slightly aware of the fact that it's going to send everything in the notebook, everything above that cell, unless you've put some blockers in it, we'll talk about. It's going to send it to the LLM. And this could be, for example, quite expensive. If you have a very large history, there is automatic truncation of various kinds. It doesn't actually send, you know, gigantic output cells in their entirety. But, you know, tokens cost money. so. If you have a very long history, uh, that takes both time and money to process that each time. But very useful if you're asking it to, you know, summarize the, you know, what you've done for the last hour or something. It'll do that. Um, and there are potentially, you know, security and privacy implications if you have some top secret government code here that you're working on. Um, you know, it's being sent to OpenAI, and uh, they will do with it as they please. So that's something to keep in mind. Um, so let's see here. Um, let's, let, I just want to show the fact that, I mean, let's make this tangent instead, right? And if I now reevaluate this input, it's going to do what I think you expect, which is that it's looking at the new history and it's, you know, it's doing it again um, with the new history. Uh, history in chat notebooks is different from the history in a kernel. In a kernel, history is basically temporal. You know, it's like if you go to a different window somewhere and do another calculation, and then you go back to your first window and ask for percent, uh, what matters is not what's above it in that window. It matters is what did you do most recently. Um, but that's not the case with chat notebooks. They don't care about the time in which something was done. They care about 
the place where it is. So it's the structural position within the notebook. If it's physically above the thing you're evaluating, then um, it will get sucked in. Um, and oh, good. This this demonstrates. Um, there's two different ways that it can do this when you ask for code. Uh, here it's written the code for me, and then it's actually gone and evaluated it. And apparently, I don't know what that's all about. Um, that's weird. The way it's vanishing like that. Um, I actually find this often more useful, and sometimes I even tell it, don't use the tool. I don't want you to actually generate the plot for me. I just want the code. Because if you get code and output like this, you can then um, click one of these things. So this one is the most useful. This copies it down below and evaluates it. So now it's just created a perfectly ordinary input cell, um, which is very useful because now if you want to change it a little bit, like you want to go to, I don't know, 4pi this way, um, it's given you a starting point. And not too infrequently, the code that it writes is almost right, but not quite. And it's got some you know, some little error in it that's pretty easy to spot. Um, but, you know, it's very useful because it's told you about some function you didn't know about or, or something like that. Um, anyway, so uh, I, I like to just get the code. I usually tell it, don't actually evaluate it for you. Other people, like Rick, whose talk you hopefully will go to right after mine, he has the opposite. He, he really likes it to do the, do the evaluation in place and don't look at the code. Um, but we need to move on here. So chat delimiters. So if you type a uh, tilde character, so shift back tick here, that gets you this gray line. And the gray line is um, is a blocker. So if I say um, that, it's going to say, I don't know what you're talking about, because it doesn't see. Uh, this line has blocked it from looking backwards um, and uh, as mentioned, these LLMs have absolute amnesia. They're stateless. Every time you hit shift return, they never knew you existed before. They've never heard of you. They have no idea what you've done other than what you send in that interaction in the moment. Um, so if I do evaluation up here, um, it's going to know because when I hit shift return here, it retransmits this entire history. Um, and here it's blocked. Um, so uh, let's see. Um, and now it's going to give me a long story about um, which, you know, didn't actually work. Come to think of it, this exclusions. This may, this may be an example of a mistake, because I think that was meant to leave out these lines, and it obviously didn't. So there's something wrong with the way it's asking for exclusions. Um, uh, but in general, like that, that's, I think, the, you know, one of the most useful things you can do with chat notebooks is have them create language for you. And so I have an example. Um, good heaven. Sometimes it's very wordy. We have another persona, which we'll get to in a minute. But, um, um, Oh, there's some questions. Uh, audio is really bad. Interesting. Um, in what way is the audio really bad? Because I don't know why it should be. I don't think I'm doing anything. You have a slight crackle. A crackle? Is it happening right now? Yes. Interesting. I have no idea what it is, because there's no crackling sounds here. It's like the fan on my computer is on. Um, no, it's, def it's definitely a mic issue, like microphone in the laptop. Well, I don't really have any alternatives, so I guess I'll just, I don't know, I'll try to talk um, louder or something, so to overcome the crackle. Um, so uh, there's a question in the chat enabled notebook, is there a way to set the temperature to zero so the LLM always outputs the same thing for a given input? The answer is yes, um, and you can do it in a couple of ways, which I'm going to get to um, only crackles when I speak. Well, like I said, I have no clue. I'm just, uh, this is the same setup I've used for a million Zoom calls and people have not complained, so I don't know. Uh, I don't know what's up with that. Um, 
Let me, okay, let, let me show an example first and then we'll get to the temperature question because it's related to several other issues. Um, this is an example, uh, which I think is, I'm gonna make another chat dilemma so it's starting um, straight here. Um, write me some code to sort numbers by their English names. So this is a, why is it misspelled there? Anyway, um, this is something where I actually needed to do that for something. And let's see what it does this time, because it's it's fascinating vari variable how it chooses to do this. Um, and sometimes it comes up, yeah, there we go. So this this is amazing. I didn't know we had a function called integer name. It would never occurred to me that we would have such a function or how to search for it, um, but we do. And if we do this, so one, three, two, yeah, that's alphabetical by its English name. Um, I thought I, I had thought of all kinds of very complicated ways one could do this that would involve big tables of how to say a number. Um, but the LLM taught me that we just have a function for that. Sometimes when you ask for this code, it actually tells you to go to Wolfram Alpha to look up the name of each number. And that's obviously a terrible way to do it. Um, um, and when it does that, like, it, like the last time I tried to do this demo, it, it wrote it using Wolfram Alpha calls, which didn't actually work. And so I just said, you know, in the next cell here, I said, don't use Wolfram Alpha. I don't have to tell it here, but, but that was enough. It said, oh, sorry, I won't use Wolfram Alpha. And it wrote this code instead, which it could have done in the first place, but didn't. Um, so that's, uh, that sort of maybe is a lead into the temperature question. So there's a lot of parameters you can set. Um, and you can set them at several different levels. So for example, I can click um, here. And so we have persona, we have the model, and then we have advanced settings. And under advanced settings is temperature. So I could set the temperature to zero here. Um, and this is now affecting only this particular input cell. Let's see what we get with temperature zero. Um, I think you, you have to watch out for temperature zero because um, although it will make it more consistent, it's not actually 100% always consistent. People's experience is that the answer is almost always bad. Um, that it's, it's almost like you need to let the thing have a little bit of creativity or it won't see things um, that it should. And so it's a double-edged sword. I mean, there've been some papers published that where they said, oh, we're just gonna set temperature to zero because that way our results are consistent. But it, it's really not effective because the results are just bad. Um, so, you know, 0.7 seems to be, I don't know exactly why that number, but that seems to be what everyone has accepted as a good compromise between, um, you know, it's a little bit random, but it's also uh, useful and gives you things that you can actually use. Um, like, let's see, does this actually work? Um, yeah, no, it doesn't because spoken string form is not a function that actually exists. Um, and, you know, this is, there's another thing it'll do. It, it you know, it makes stuff up. Um, sometimes um, we've actually found, uh, I mean, Stephen has been inspired that in a number of cases where it's like, oh, that's actually a really good idea for a function. Why don't we have that? Uh, you know, it makes up functions that make sense. And in this case, we do actually have this function. It's just not that, that's not what it's called. Um, it's actually called um, um, whatever it was um, that it got last time. So anyway, yeah, temperature zero, you can do it. You can set that set it on an individual one. If you have a chat block divider, you can set it here for, you know, everything that comes below it here, or you can do go here and you can set it for your entire notebook. Um, and you can also in the preferences, which I'm not going to show you because they're, they're just, this is a development version. That's a little bit flaky in the preferences panel. Um, you can set it globally. So if you want to just say temperature zero globally, you can, but um, I wouldn't, wouldn't actually recommend it. Um, I've just always left it at seven. Um, and what exactly that means is fascinating and, and how it affects the sort of psychology of the ALM is fascinating, but we've only got eight minutes left. So, um, so let me then show you next personas. 
so let's make another chat delimiter and chat input style. So personas are basically prompts that are um, that are prepended as system prompts to the, the data that's sent to the LLM together with your chat history and your new question. So it's, it's basically just a block of code. And, and some of them, you know, that block of code is quite large, like Code Assistant and Code Writer. They are pretty large, complicated prompts that instruct it in detail, you know, uh, how to properly format Mathematica code so that it will be recognized and so that you'll get these automatic things. These happen because the prompting has caused the output to be structured in a certain way. Um, tells it how to use the tools. Um, you know, sets it up. Some of the prompts are quite simple, like group. The prompting is quite simple. Um, and hopefully it will actually work. Um, yes. So the group persona simply answers, I am group, no matter what you ask it. Except sometimes it can't stand it. It can't help itself and it keeps talking anyway because it's an LLM and prompts are only approximate requests. Um, I'll go back to So the difference between code assistant and code writer, code assistant, uh, it's like it writes you code and it also talks about it. Code writer is supposed to just write the code and not explain it. So, um, This should just give me a block of code and not waste time talking about it. Or not. Oh, good heavens. Mm. Yeah, that's not, uh, it's not going in a good direction. Let's support that. Try that again. Slowness, unfortunately, is entirely out of our hands. That garbage spilling out was huh, not again. Um, this is like it's spilling the guts of what the response is without properly parsing it. Which, yeah. Yeah, that's disappointing. I wonder if this is a persona problem. Let's try that in the code assistant for something. This this example it really works quite reliably. Um, but maybe the code writer has some new bugs in its prompting. Anyway, while that's thinking, let me show you um, some things about personas. So we have. Um, if you go to add manage personas here, um, you, oh, probably not until it's finished the evaluation. Yeah. So yeah, this is where code writer would have shut up and let me play with it instead of keep talking. All right, now the menu came up. Okay, but while we're here, so I mean, although it took a while, um, you know, I don't know. I think that it's important to be astonished every once in a while, uh, even when you've been doing this for quite a while, that it's possible to actually just say that and get a, an, an, you know, an interactive widget, dynamic object, user interface thing just works. And it's just right there. It just works. This is not something that in my entire life experience, I thought you'd be able to do with a computer this soon. 
Um, cause it didn't really seem like there was anything heading in that direction. And then boom, all of a sudden about a year ago, yes. Okay. All right, fine. Computers can actually, you can just talk to them and they do what you want. Um, and this kind of thing is only going to get more and more powerful. Um, okay. We're really going, this is supposed to be an hour long talk, but it's really only half an hour. So, uh, ad managed personas, this, um, this lets you control which different personas you have. And we have a prompt repository, which has, I'm not going to go there because we don't have time, but this has a, a bunch of different personas you can install to do things like, you know, they're good at summarizing or they write in a certain style or they try to explain things intuitively, you know, different sorts of personalities um, that you might want to have. And then there's uh, tools. So uh, tools are a, a very powerful thing. They're similar to plugins. You may have heard about the, the Wolfram Alpha and Wolfram Language uh, plugins that OpenAI has deployed, which help the public web version of, of uh, GPT not give bad answers for math. Tools are like the private version of that. Um, and they can do things like, you know, search the web or search files on your computer, um, search our documentation, call Wolfram Alpha. And the difference between the, these and a the plugin is that these things, if you enable one of them, they're actually going back to your computer. They're running Wolfram language code on your computer as opposed to on, you know, some public server somewhere, which is both scary and also much more powerful because you can ask it to do things with your files. Uh, there's a certain amount of sandboxing, but nevertheless, um, you know, you want to be careful. You can write your own tools where you get to write the Mathematica code that will be called along with the prompting that will instruct the LLM when to use this tool. Um, and this is all getting into sort of more advanced stuff. So here's the deal. Um, this talk is almost over. Uh, we didn't even get the chat driven notebooks, but at 1130, uh, Rick is, um, is giving, um, who is the, one of the main developers on the chat notebook technology. Uh, he is giving a more technical talk. Uh, which is primarily focused on, um, so, you know, notebooks are not just a thing that you can use. Notebooks are also a development environment. People have written whole big complicated interfaces. We have uh, all these menus, for example, these are all just notebooks, right? They're notebook objects uh, there. Uh, it's programming, you know, sort of front-end code programming in mathematical language to drive an interface. Well, you can do the same thing with chat notebooks. There's a bunch of, of new things you can do using chat notebooks to create sort of LLM driven user interfaces uh, as a platform rather than as a, you know, a thing that you use just interactively the way that a normal user uses a thing. So as a tool more so than, a, than an application. Um, and if that's what you're interested in, you should switch um, soon, like in the next two minutes, you should switch over to Rick's talk. Um, but I'm gonna hang around for a little while uh, as long as there are questions and try to answer questions for people who just want to use chat notebooks as opposed to um, use, you know, as opposed to develop tools using chat notebook programming technology. Um, so uh, let's see, oh, we have some questions. Um, uh, So actually all the questions are about my crackling sounds. Um, okay, here's a question. Does the persona setting wrap the input in some kind of special prompt guiding the LLM how to respond? Yes, um, it, that's what a persona is. That's in fact, the only thing that a persona is, is a prompt. Uh, and it's prepended and it's sent, if you're familiar with uh, the way that these things work, um, when you send text to an LLM, you can label it uh, as what the role of the text is. And the role can be like system. And that is then, you know, that means this is to be taken as a commandment. You are to do this. The system is ordering you to do this. You can uh, send it as user text, which is, um, you know, this is what the user has typed. You should look at it and respond to it. Um, or you can send it as uh, assistant, labeled as assistant text. And that means this is what you said. This is what the LLM said. And in, or, and in order to have a, you know, the history for the, the, the LLM to consider, you need to send it all of that stuff, including what it said. This can be used in various ways, both um, useful and nefarious, because you can just change what the LLM actually said. What you send back as history doesn't have to be what it sent you. It can be whatever you'd like it to have said. 
then that will cause it, that will actually influence its future output. Um, um, but the persona is simply a system prompt that's sent first. Um, and you can see the system prompts in the prompt repository. If you look at the, the different personas, um, you can see them there. You can also see them, so an interesting thing, if you say percent after a chat evaluation, I think this will work. Um, yeah, so the, the value of percent after you've done a chat evaluation is what's called a chat object. And uh, a chat object is a sort of mathematical language interface. So that, I should mention, you can, all this, all this kind of chat stuff, you can do it using kernel functions as a language thing, as opposed to as an interface thing. And chat objects are used in that whole system. I'm sure there's other talks about that. And they let you see, you know, in complete sort of code detail, what actually happened. Um, by default, their display form um, doesn't include the system prompt, but I believe if I say, well, I'm going to say, I hate percent. Um, I'm going to say object equals percent percent evaluate. So if I say object, I think, yes. Okay, so if I just ask for the messages property of this object, this will give me everything. And that includes here, role is system, content is boom. Here's the code assistant um, prompt. And you see it's quite lengthy. And a lot of it has to do, oh, these are, so these are tool usage prompts. Um, these are telling it how to call different tools. Actually, most of this, the prompt is the tool usage. Um, and then there's examples saying if the user asks this kind of thing, and it, LLMs are remarkably good at generalizing from specific examples, sort of by induction. Nobody knows how that works. I don't think so, anyway. Um, anyway, so this big, long prompt. And yes, you can see it all. You could, you know, modify it, make your own. Um, and uh, yeah, this is what you can see the, sort of the whole history. Um, let's see. Um, can you tell fascinating aspects of temperature? Well, yeah, the temperature is a fascinating property. Uh, it goes in the case of open AI models, it goes between zero and two. Who knows why? It's almost as arbitrary as the Fahrenheit scale. Um, but uh, it, you know, its technical definition is, um, you know, these things are looking at the probability of the next token. And if you set temperature to zero, it will use whichever token has the highest probability of coming next, according to its calculations. Um, as it's, you know, generating output linearly one token at a time, it looks like, what is the most likely possible token? I have to pick that one. With a higher temperature, it will randomly choose between um, all the tokens that have at least a certain threshold of likeliness. And why it is that that causes it to be more creative and give better answers often, like, you know, not, not just more creative and interesting or random answers, but actually better answers, I don't know. Um, it, it's, yeah, it's, the volumes have been written about this and the people who, if anybody actually does know, they're not talking because it's, you know, it's, it's like a, a very um, deep part of the system or, or sort of, I don't know. Stephen has some blog posts about it. It's fascinating. It's it's messy. It's the new world. Um, yeah. So so somebody mentioned Stephen's blog. Uh, his blog is quite good in explaining some aspects of what temperature means. I mean, the the thing that I think is most surprising about these LMs is that you talk about well, most likely token, and it sounds very lexical. It sounds like you know you're just generating strings of text by likelihood, which obviously can't give you anything you know, that, that involves the kind of creativity and insight that you see coming from these things. And I think that's because this this tokenization and probability whatever, it's applying in sort of concept space too, not just lexical space. And deep inside in these many layers, um, you know, it's, it's moving through stages of conceptualization and abstraction rather than stages of lexical uh, text generation. Um, um, so yeah, it's, um, it's complicated. I don't know, difficult, but amazing and worth looking into. And Stephen's blog is quite good. Uh, question, can you make your own persona? Yes, you can make your own persona. Um, 
there, if you go to the uh, prompt repository, there's a template notebook. This might be a good thing to, um, I think Rick might talk about that in his talk. I'm not sure the details of how to do it. There's a sort of a template notebook that you get and then you fill in um, what you want the prompt to be. And you know, that this, is, this gets into prompt engineering, the question of, you know, how do you, um, you know, how do you get, how do you write a good prompt? So, um, you know, how do you write a good prompt? Well, uh, there's different, um, there's different philosophies on that. I think, uh, um, I think Stephen's assessment is, is one that I largely agree with, which is that it's like persuasive writing. You know, if you're trying to convince somebody to do something, um, that sort of language seems to be relatively effective as language for prompting. Um, you know, you don't give it um, partial sentences or just kind of staccato commands or whatever. You give it clearly written exposition of what is the correct thing to do and what is not the right thing to do. You give it examples to follow. So basically, the same kind of thing that would work with a graduate student, maybe it works with the LLM too. You know, you have to be clear, um, don't muddle things, make sure the ideas are expressed well, and somehow it picks that up and those, those turn into like nice clean vectors somewhere in concept space that it can follow. Um, but it's definitely a bit of a black art and, uh, you know, sometimes repetition helps, sometimes it doesn't. Some people seem to be better at it than others. Um, I don't know. Uh, I just keep typing different things until it starts doing what I want. Um, and, uh, and, and usually get frustrated along the way. Um, let's see. Yeah. Oh, so I could just mention chat driven notebooks is something that I, that I had not to go back to sharing the screen, not mentioned. Um, so let's see, go back to, so the difference, uh, between a chat driven, uh, chat enabled notebook is what we've been doing. It's like you're, you're basically, if you start typing, you get a Mathematica input cell. If you type single quote, you get a chat input cell. Chat driven notebook, um, uh, it's just by default, if you start typing, um, so I didn't type anything extra. I just typed a letter and, um, and uh, it creates a chat input cell. And I think it's also the default, yeah, the default persona is plain chat as opposed to code writer. And plain chat basically just means minimal additional prompting beyond what the raw, you know, what you would get on the web if you just went to the web interface. A little tiny bit just so that it knows about the fact that it's in a notebook environment and there are certain things um, that it can do. Um, uh, but yeah, so now it's going to tell me about dogs. I should have said, no, you're talking about dogs and tried to confuse it. Um, uh, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not sure what the point of chat driven notebooks is. I think there's a possibility we're going to get rid of them because it doesn't seem that they're perhaps as useful as we might've thought. What I thought might be a very useful variation is the idea that at some point, and for some users, you might stop really or, or never start thinking about this place as a place where you write Mathematica code to solve your problems. Rather, it's a place where you interact with a chat bot who solves problems for you. And you rarely, if ever, actually interact with the code itself. You just interact with the chat bot, which is continually writing and modifying um, and improving code for you. And that situation, a chat driven notebook where the default input is chat input uh, would make sense, but the default persona would be code, you know, code writer, not, um, not plain chat. So we might, you know, and I think the, and right now it's the system is like the world's not quite ready for that. It can write code, but it can't write code well enough. It, it's a, there's enough situations where the code just doesn't quite work or it doesn't work at all. And you kind of end up having to drop down eventually into the level of the code itself and make some modifications. Not that that isn't useful because it often gets you very close. And, you know, for in, in my case where, you know, I've been using Mathematica for 35 years, 
it shows me functions I didn't know exist and techniques I didn't realize and, you know, new functions. Like I didn't know we had an up to function, which is tremendously useful. Or, you know, what are the arguments to partition? There's a, so many of them and they're so confusing. Um, and it will just, you know, it'll get that stuff for you and you don't have to try to go to the documentation. It kind of, it's like an automatic example generator that gives you an example that's very, very close to the thing you actually wanted. But then you do still have to go and, you know, do a little bit of extra work. Um, um, and so the, the world is, I think, not quite ready there for a purely chat-driven um, uh, interface where you don't actually use code at all. But I feel like it'll get there. And at that point, maybe uh, a chat-driven text, you know, chat-only sort of notebook will make more sense. Uh, any plans for adopting debating? Oh, between different LLMs uh, in the chat notebooks. Yeah, so that's something, again, I didn't get to. Um, that's something I've thought would be really cool, and it's, it's almost there. Um, so, I mean, you can have different personas. You can switch and get a different answer from a different persona. What I would like to be able to do, we had this idea, which um, is that you can say at sign, um, at sign, and then the name of a persona. So let's see, what are some names that I could use? Uh, 19th, that's too, I'm gonna say at sign group. 19th century novelist is too hard to type. Um, so this theoretically now sends the conversation to the group persona, uh, but it may not have worked because um, he's not supposed to say that. Anyway. What I would really like to have work, but it's not implemented yet, is that you'd be able to say at sign more than one different thing, right? Like you could say at sign one thing, at sign, you know, another one, at sign another one, and then get back simultaneously or maybe sequentially three different responses based on three different personas. Um, and that seems to me like that would be very cool. And I, I hope that we will go ahead and implement that at some point, that you can just give a list of the different personas you want a single input to be sent to. Um, and another thing that I think would be very cool, for example, and not hard to do, would be um, multiple temperature answers. Like, give me this answer, but at several different temperature settings. Um, ultimately, though, if you're trying to do certain things like that, you really should be using the language version of these things, like LLM synthesize, um, you know, uh, well, I'm just going to say hello because it gives you a short answer. So you don't have to use chat notebooks for all of this. You can do, um, you can do all of these kinds of interactions using programmatic constructs, you know, symbolic programming constructs. And here, for example, there's, I don't know, the, I don't remember the option names, but you can give it you know, options for what model you want to use. Let's say you want to try this out on GPT-4 and 3.5 and 2, and you want to try it on BARD and, you know, whatever, you know, five different models. Well, you can just map, you know, just say map LLM synthesize onto, you know, some options here, uh, onto a list of, um, uh, a list of models or service connection specifications or whatever you have. Um, you can use all that stuff um, something, a very simple function that I feel like probably somebody has written is how about take an input, this some question, uh, send it to the LLM with high temperature, like 1.5 or something, really extreme. Like it's, the thing is on acid, it's making stuff up um, 10 times, come up with 10 wild answers, and then send each of those answers or send, send all 10 of those answers to the LLM with a much lower, more sober temperature and ask it to evaluate which of these is the best answer. Um, that's a very simple function you could write, you know, symbolically uh, using things like LLM synthesize and some of the other low level functions. Um, and maybe that would be really good because that's the, the, you know, LLM equivalent of a brainstorming session where you get people together and say, well, just, you know, throw out ideas, just come up with whatever you want, you know, no filter. Uh, and maybe, you know, maybe most of the ideas are stupid, but uh, but something, you know, something brilliant comes up because of the randomness and the sort of freedom of not trying to be too sensible. Uh, but then you need to look at all those ideas, write them down and throw out the crazy ones. Um, 
and you know, and, and in the cold light of reason, pick something that's better. Well, you can do that, but it's not something you probably want to try to do, you know, in a chat notebook as such, you do it in language, um, that kind of thing. Uh, possible to use different modal ML systems, like having GPT-4 write a beautiful description of a scene and then send it over to Midjourney to synthesize it. Yes, absolutely. Um, you can do that. Uh, um, and probably the easiest way to do that kind of thing, if you want to create a pipeline, is um, is to do it uh, programmatically. You know, use LM synthesize, and then there's image synthesize. I think it's what it's called. Um, and all these have options. You can choose, you know, which which model you want to send it to. A thing that I'm working on is sort of automated tutoring system. One thing we do there is we have, uh, you know, after the student has uh, done some input, uh, we ask us we have a sort of a side conversation with the LLM. Uh, using the, the fanciest one we can get, GPT-4, which is much better than all the others, um, ask it, you know, look at this uh, history that the student has had with the chat. Does it seem like they understand the, the topic? And GPT-4 is sophisticated enough to be able to make a reasonable judgment about that. We, we, the prompting asks it to, you know, write a couple sentences about the student's level of understanding. Um, but then the software needs to make a, a yes or no decision. Like, should we now... Tell, you know, suggest that the student move on to the next topic because they've understood this one. And that's a much easier task. It just needs to look at the sophisticated summary that's been generated by the expensive high-level LLM and just kind of say yes or no. Did, did the student understand it based on this summary? So that, uh, that I'm sending to 3.5 Turbo, which is 10 times cheaper and also faster. So you know, in, in, in a programmatic environment, you have complete control over this. You can mix and match things. It's, I mean, this, this is a very powerful concept, the synthesis of symbolic computing with LLM style computing. Um, you get, you know, a thing which is much more powerful than either of them uh, alone, precisely because you can use the sort of the precision um, of symbolic programming or, you know, traditional computer programming type programming and and then you know call out to an LM like you you have a certain structure you you have an interface it's implemented in you know thousands of lines of of traditional computer code but at some point you need to decide did the student answer this question correctly and that's completely outside the scope of what you can plausibly do with uh, pre LLM technology if uh, this, you know if the question is you know so one example I have is ask the student describe exponential notation in your own words. Like, just tell me what it is. There's never been a system in the history of computing that can judge that answer effectively um, until GPT-4. I mean, not even 3.5 can do it very well, but 4 can do it pretty well. Um, and that's amazing and incredibly powerful. But it's, it's one little slice of functionality that's fit into a traditional piece of, you know, software engineering that's implementing uh, a, a courseware or, t or teaching system. Um, so, you know, it's, it's that it's this combination that you're asking about that is, um, I think very powerful. Um, and now I think we're, we're like, well, well over time and people should probably go on to other people's talks. Go back to the camera. I'm going to wave goodbye and thank you all for attending.